Before we get started, I wanted to thank Avast for supporting this episode of Too Good To Be True. With Avast One, you can confidently take control of your online world by helping you stay safe from viruses, phishing attacks, ransomware, hacking attempts, and other cyber crimes. Learn more about Avast One at avast.com. Welcome to Too Good to Be True, an investigative podcast about exposing the scams, schemes, and financial cults trying to separate you from your money. I'm journalist and editor Ryan Houlihan. And I'm Julia Lorenz Olson, co-host of PBS's Two Cents and an accredited financial counselor. What are we talking about today? So let's start with a story, shall we? Okay. It's February 2020. Oh, dear. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's so Raven zooming me back. <laughs> <laughs> How little we knew. Yeah. I am at the airport about to board a flight all by myself to go skiing. All by my lonesome. The wow. first time I'd gone skiing after having a child. And I, I'm half Swiss. So I grew up on skis. Yeah. And so I was so excited to get out to Utah and get my butt on those mountains. So I'm walking up to the gate. I'm already excited. And then my excitement shoots into the stratosphere because who do I behold at my gate? My idol at the time, the one and only Rachel Hollis. So for the listener, if you're unaware, Rachel in general is a writer and a self-help guru and a public speaker, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, event planner, a million other things. And I, I think I own her book, which I've never read. <laughs> um, but who, who is she? What, what, what made you so excited? Oh, that's that is a whole story, <laughs> which we will get to. I will, I will say, like, so. I think it's important to sort of share where I was at the time that I saw her, and not only was it her, but also her husband on this same plane, Dave Hollis, who will be a big factor in this whole story. But at the time, I my PBS show had just come out and the numbers were just kind of like blowing up. Um, and I'm like a theater kid. So my, you know, I had dreams of Broadway that I had like set aside and I'm working with my husband. So my husband, Philip, and I co-wrote, co-hosted. We were also running a new business together. We own a financial planning firm. And so I was also, you know, a newish mom. Rachel Hollis, also like a, a mother. I, you know, looked at myself as I was – self-identified as like a Christian at the time, but like a liberal one, mm -hmm. you know? And so Rachel Hollis was this Venn diagram. I mean, I saw her and I saw this is a woman who's running an empire at a, the most basic level. She is or really has become a self-help guru. She started out as an event planner turned kind of mommy blogger turned um tone, guru celeb you influencer yes type. turned in her own words like she wanted to become the female tony robbins wow yeah red flag <laughs> <laughs> oh the amount of red flags that i missed i mean i must have been colorblind Actually, regarding all those red flags, we got the chance to talk with YouTuber and author Savvy Lyser, who was an early voice on social media criticizing Rachel's advice on the channel Savvy Writes Books. Here's what Savvy had to say. My name is Savvy. I run a YouTube channel. It's called Savvy Writes Books. On my channel, my specialties are focusing on the intersection of books and business. So, of course, you know, as a woman in business myself, I was drawn to the book Girl, Wash Your Face. So I read it back in 2018, didn't like it, uh, found a lot of positive reviews of it everywhere I could find, and I didn't see what the hype was. So I was like, you know what, I've got a new channel I'm starting where I'm doing these book reviews, so I think I'll just share my thoughts on it. So then after that, um, you know, I'd kind of make fun of the book here and there. But for the most part, I was like, I didn't think about Rachel too hard until I saw her start speaking at these multi-level marketing conferences. She was like doing the keynotes at the Beachbody conference and the 
LuLaRoe and the Rodan and Fields and just all those conferences. So I started doing some reaction videos to those to point out, you know, how the things she's saying about business were false. And a lot of these things she had to know better because, you know, she was a successful business owner herself. So I was pointing out kind of the manipulation. It's not just her, you know, there's the Tony Robbinses of the world. There's the Grant Cardones. There's all these other business gurus that do the exact same thing. So I've been calling them out as well. But the thing that she, that annoyed me about her was the same thing that annoyed me about so many other people. At this time, I'd been just reading so many self-help books in the business genre and getting no help from them. And that's what annoyed me about her. Like, I didn't even know about the MLM stuff yet. I didn't even know about like, I didn't know about like, I, I knew that I could tell from the book that she talked about being married to a Disney executive and that's how she got her start. And I was kind of like, well, that's not, that's not totally relatable. When I encountered her, I, like I said, it just, she just hit this Venn diagram of relatability, accessibility, um, this, you know, there was this parasocial relationship that felt very, um, she just felt accessible. I remember messaging her, of course, who I thought was her through Facebook when I initially heard about her, you know, through another podcast that I listened to and she responded to me and wow. I was like, hook, you know, yeah. immediately. So, and then she also had a mix of biological children and an adopted child, which was something that I was really, you know, passionate about. She had also experienced what it was like to be a foster care family. And that was something I was also very passionate about and have been for a long time. So her, seeing her felt like a sign. I mean, it really did. You got did. bingo. You got like, it was like all the squares are in a perfect line. It was line. all the things. And, you know, saying it now, one of the things in researching her and hearing other women talk about their experience of sort of delving into the Rachel Hollis cult is that feeling of like, I saw myself in her. So mm -hmm. it's actually not a unique experience, even though I may have – a few more overlaps than most people do when it comes to her, that feeling of seeing yourself in her is not at all uncommon. Guest Savvy Lyser also got pulled into the thrall of Rachel's relatability. I noticed in my experience and in some of the videos that I've made, I've kind of pointed out that I have a lot in common with her. Like there are a lot of things that I could relate to. I mean, for one thing, I, as I pointed out in my videos, I loved, I loved and hated her talks about getting a boob job because I recently had plastic surgery and it's changed my life for the better. So I'm like, on the one hand, I love that you're positive about that. On the other hand, she talks so negatively about her body beforehand that I'm like, there's a little negativity there. It was always kind of a mixed bag. I think the thing that drew people to her was, first of all, being a successful woman in business. And I think she came right at this time of the the blog and influencer world had been so into perfection and posting these like very nice images, very professional looking photography, showing off all the things that you could achieve. And then she came in here also doing that, but with this, this injected layer of relatability of, you know, I'm a mess just like you. I, I just, I'm gross like you are. Let me tell you about my farts for like a whole page. Like, so it was just, um, I will say she's a good writer. She's got a great sense of humor. She's funny. She's good at telling stories. So I think that that's definitely what brings people in as well. And then, you know, from there it's okay. Well, this woman's a successful business owner and she's, you know, has all the same issues that I might have to deal with in my life. So maybe I can do it too if I kind of follow her path. I think that's probably what draws people. So this is February of 2020. And only four months later, something would happen with her that somehow caused me to see this huge part of my vision for my future that I had borrowed from her mm. crumble. So let's maybe start down the rabbit hole of Rachel Hollis. 
Well, I remember her being vaguely popular, and then I remember hearing about a big cancellation. Like, I saw trending Twitter <laughs> topics, but because I wasn't invested, I never really dived in. Yes. So had I been invested, what are the things I might have known about Rachel? Like I mentioned earlier, she really started out as a blogger, an event planner back in LA in the mid-2000s. She eventually started a, a website called The Chic Site, but what really got her started in writing was writing a series of novellas in 2014 called Party Girl (laughs) that centered around this kind of like, you know, small town girl goes to LA, becomes this chic party planner, and she like spills all the tea, right? (laughs) Mm, Very Devilers product. (laughs) Yes. And she finds love, of course, like in the interim, right? Um, But then in 2015, what really kind of put her, I think, on the quote-unquote influencer track was a photo that she posted of herself on social media that just blew up. I mean, it really, truly went viral. Um, so would you like me to read it Yes, for you? please. Give me, the, give me the take. The picture that she posted is of her. And so if you don't know, Rachel Hollis is a pretty short, as I am, uh, white woman who is absolutely thin. I mean, by every stretch of the imagination, you know, she is a thin white woman with, at the time, a, you know, the classic balayage hair, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so this is what she posted. She, It's her in a bikini on what looks like a, you know, Florida beach. And she says, I have stretch marks and I wear a bikini. I have a belly that's permanently flabby from carrying three giant babies and I wear a bikini. My belly button is saggy which is something I didn't even know was possible before. And I wear a bikini. I wear a bikini because I'm proud of this body and every mark on it. Those marks prove that I was blessed enough to carry my babies and that flabby tummy means I worked hard to lose what weight I could. I wear a bikini because the only man whose opinion matters knows what I went through to look this way. That same man says he's never seen anything sexier than my body, marks and all. They aren't scars, ladies. They're stripes and you've earned them. Flaunt that body with pride, Hashtag Hollis Holiday. So, like, tell me your impressions. First off, this all sounds good, but it still really does glorify looking as conventionally, yes. quote unquote, perfect yes. as possible. And in the photo that you've linked to here, she is, I mean, yes, there is like clearly she has some sort of stippling on her stomach stretch marks from being pregnant, but she is by every other measure one of the most symmetrical and beautiful white women I have yeah. seen in a, today. You know what I mean? <laughs> She's absolutely stunning. And so it, I can see the intoxicating, especially in 2015, nature of talking openly about this stuff. Yes. Because I think what really grabbed me is, because I haven't seen this photo in many years, but I was like, what did women say? Like these comments, right? And so I mean, I mean there's five hundred thousand likes nearly. Five hundred thousand likes. And just so many pictures of like, you know, I know how you feel. The kids gave me my body too. I wouldn't change it for the world. Like, this is me, three kids, with the youngest being 19, and I had weight loss surgery almost two years ago. Like, just these women who are like, Thank you for posting this, but at the same time, let's talk about how thin I am becoming. Yes. I mean, the, it, it is a cathartic experience to start yeah. sharing these viewpoints, but a lot of these viewpoints echo extremely similar. And in my opinion, toxic sentiments about, yes. I, I might not look perfect, but I'm close, which already admits that there is an ideal which we should all be working towards, which is white and thin. And exactly. And the fact that she's talking about like, and now I can see this, right? This 2020 vision, you know, hindsight, hindsight. vision it for me. Oh, it's actually a bitch when it comes to <laughs> this. Um, but when she says, I wear a bikini because the, o- because the only man. Mm. So- it's it's very subtle, but there is this shift of away from like I'm proud of myself because of what my body has done to I am allowed to be proud of myself because of what a man thinks about me. And even if that man is your most trusted confidant, quote unquote, it still says it sets the table that you need a man's approval, at least one. Correct. Correct. So this image 
goes viral on Facebook, on Instagram. And then pretty soon afterwards, she comes out in February 2018 with her sort of memoir slash self-help guide called Girl, Wash Your Face. Have you ever heard of this book? This was the book that I own. I got sent it by an old, I used to do book reviews uh, for a magazine and they sent it to me and I never got around to reading it, but it is in my home right now. (laughs) (laughs) So I know the, 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 and the cover is, I mean, it is a perfect book pitch cover. She's sitting looking very relatable, a little tired, harried, but still perfect glam. Exactly. So so what you're describing is something that I saw come up a lot in, um, you know, journalistic interpretations of who she's become. And it's called curated imperfection. Mm. Oh, that is a good phrase. Oh my gosh. And I'm telling you, like, this is so pivotal to the success of brands like her and other brands where they show you just enough of the quote unquote imperfections, of the quote unquote hard things. But as you will see, not quite enough, no. right? It's just enough. It's these very filtered versions of imperfection. So Girl, Wash Your Face became a smashing success very quickly. I mean, it just absolutely, you know, New York Times bestseller. And it kind of, you know, the messaging of it. So if you don't want to read this, <laughs> here's here's the thing. She talks about her life as kind of a syllabus. Yeah? Okay. Like, here is my life. Here are the choices that I've made. And here are the ways that I have overcome. And the reason I'm telling you this is that I want to convince you that only you are responsible for your fate and your happiness. So this is that kind of confirmation bias of I have a beautiful life. It's worked out for me. So if I can do it, anyone can do it. Bingo. Bingo. And, you know, to be semi-fair, she did grow up like on the poverty line. Like she didn't grow up. um, She was the uh, daughter of a Pentecostal preacher. Oh, okay. Oh, yes. (laughs) So that just like sort of sets the – sets the background and there are lots and lots of tie-ins to the Pentecostal background. But she grew up watching someone on stage telling people what they should do with their life, right? I mean, and, and it isn't always, it's not necessarily a red flag, but it is a common theme among mm-hmm. con artists and guru types, people who propose that they have all the answers to have some of that in their background because it gives you a common language with the people you need to sell to. Yes, absolutely. And while there was kind of some initial pushback on the messaging of the book, like through BuzzFeed, it was ultimately sort of drowned out by this like legion of adoring fans. They were haters. So that is a big theme of, you know, Seeing criticism as hate, I think this is like, here's a a lesson that I'm taking away. If you're following somebody whose only avenue of filtering criticism is to brand it as hate, Mm. you know there's a problem. Right. It's like there's there can be no nuance in my message. You either love me or you hate me and you hate me because you're jealous of me. And I'm polarizing because I have something to say important to say something that's right and they don't want you to know. And it you know, you you, and a lot of that filling in of narrative I've seen happen on not on the end of the guru or the influencer. It happens. The audience themselves will talk themselves into why the guru is correct. Here's Savvy Lyser to talk a little bit about how self-help gurus can control their audience's narratives about them. I don't think that necessarily all influencers are bad. I mean, some people could even say I'm an influencer, could say you guys are an influencer. You know, I guess people will almost use that for anyone who makes their career online. I don't, I don't, I think that the main thing to look out for, I guess, is the transparency and communication. And it's the same thing with any other job. If you're going to work a job for a boss who you feel like is never honest with you about what your job is or doesn't communicate clearly with you, that can tend to be a red flag for a bad work environment. Same kind of thing. Do you feel that they're being honest with you? And if you do, do you feel that they take criticism? That's a big thing as well. Because one of the things I noticed, and this is this is a thing, taking criticism is tough for a lot of people. 
And I understand uh, the desire to want to close off a lot of the negativity you see in your life. I mean, I've, I've been feeling it a lot more lately with like being on Twitter and being like, should I get off of Twitter? Because I'm seeing so much anti LGBT stuff on Twitter. It makes me like not want to see this. So it's like knowing when to take in certain bits of negativity. But if you see someone that doesn't open themselves up to any negativity or any criticism at all, like that's generally going to be somewhat of a red flag. Or if someone says straight up, I only think positively, it's positive vibes only, I tend to say, okay, well, maybe this person, uh, maybe they're not necessarily to be the most trustworthy source. That's, that's one of the things I'd look out for. I have fallen down a self-help journey myself uh, as a teenager and a Please young adult. help me not feel so alone in this. I um I worked in a library when I was in high school and it was my only access to queer culture, gay culture, mm. the larger world of camp and like a related things and so I would check out stacks and stacks of books at a time that were filled with information I might want to know about my own community or the world. But in there would be self-help books that were written by people who were in my community. And their sales strategy is very similar to what your sales strategy you got from Rachel was, which was, look, I'm exactly like you, except better in every way. And I got to publish a book. So if you read my book, like maybe you'll be more like me. And it filled in that book is a ton of stuff that will do nothing substantively to change my circumstances. Exactly. Like the messaging is actually very boilerplate. Like when you get down to like, what are you selling me? There's nothing actually unique. It's just the packaging that it comes in looks fucking, more like you. Yeah. Right. And so, and that I think is another big red flag that I noticed is like, be careful when the end result is the person, right? Mm -hmm. Where they are the ultimate arbiter of if you've done things well enough. Do you, does your life look more like mine? Then you have done right. Yeah. Right? It also creates a subjective bubble around things where it's it's how, well, maybe you're not looking at it the way that I'm looking at it and that's why you're not getting results. Or maybe you, you, you're missing some X factor that I have and all you need to do is think yourself there. Oh, we will get there. <laughs> So she has this narrative of herself that she builds, especially in her first book, as like this bootstrappy person, right? So she like dropped out of college. She accepts this production job at Miramax out in LA. And she just conveniently leaves out the fact that even though she says – she did meet her eventual husband, Dave Hollis, at 19. Uh, he was 27. Oh, boy. And, yeah, <laughs> there's there's a whole other road we could go down on, on that. But he was a Disney executive. Oh, wow. And so she ends up leaving Miramax to start an event planning business. And ostensibly, although she never says this or acknowledges it, basically uses her, you know, contacts through Dave to build this business. And, you know, she said that she hosted all of these parties for, like, Bradley Cooper and, like, you know, very big name celebrities as evidence of her ability to come from nothing. And then, boom, we're with the look, star. Look, look at how I met all these people that I, you, I'm not giving you the details on yes. where they came from. And it's ostensibly her choices that got her there, yeah. right? Nobody else's choices. Nobody else's influence or, you know, resources that help get her there. Or luck, frankly. No. <laughs> and I think something that I didn't really pick up on at the time but now is so um, apparent to me is the really intense financial messaging that comes through especially in her in her first book and her second book which we'll talk about a little bit later so when it comes to money Rachel has a very clear view on it that like monetary success is an intrinsic sign of success as a human person, mm. <laughs> like period. Um, like in one of her kind of famous stories in Girl, Wash Your Face, she talks about being ashamed of this birthday party that her mother threw her that was very, very low budget. And she says, like, I knew I wanted to be rich. 
period. Which I think is very interesting when you think about there is a culture in charismatic churches of like naming and claiming that there is power in your voice and being able to speak things into being. Mm. And she really kind of subtly weaves that in. But it's very clear that like wealth and financial prosperity, you cannot be deemed successful without it, period. It's part of the prosperity gospel thing, too. Absolutely. Where you're intrinsically a good person or a better person. Yeah. I think it's no coincidence that she uh, hearkens to Dave Ramsey and Tony Robbins as being her idols, the people that she is trying to emulate in this. But I think it's kind of ironic in that there's really no acknowledgement that money is the key to having the time to devote to all of this self-improvement. Like many of the goals that she's like espousing that women should have, have price tags attached. So one of the um, practices that she espouses, which I actually did for a long time and still see honestly a little bit of value in is she writes in this journal. She writes like 10 things that she's grateful for and then 10 dreams that she has oh. as if they're happening in the current moment. So like I make okay. $1 million a year, right? So kind of naming it and claiming it. I'm a very successful YouTuber. I I, Bingo. I can run a marathon. Things yes. that I would like in my life but aren't real. Yeah, exactly right. And the thing that was on the top of her list was I only fly first class for a long time. And now, and guess what happened? So you know she was in first class when I passed her oh, on absolutely. that <laughs> on that plane trip that I was with her on. And by the way, I went past her and I actually like spoke to Dave. I was like, hey, I just want to say like, I really love your content. Thank you so much. And he was like, oh, thank you. You're so sweet. Zero acknowledgement from her. Like, wow. and I'm not saying that she owes that to me at but all. But this image of answering every message and being yes. so accessible. Yes, exactly. I just thought it was kind of interesting. <laughs> I've seen huge stars on a plane and they were... I've seen the gamut of, of yeah, behavior. I've of seen course. the bad behavior. I saw Kristen Chenoweth speak with every <gasps> single person who walked by her Kristen! first class seat. Oh my gosh. I love her so much. But there is a kind of hedonic treadmill approach to her goals that she espouses for women. So like once you are in that zone of flying first class, now guess what it became? I only fly private. Oh, no. Oh, so my God. So there is no kind of end to It's always these. an end there. And the growth could be in your mind. Infinite. Exactly. Exactly right. We'd once again like to thank our friends at Avast for supporting today's episode. Protecting yourself and your online presence has never been more important than it is today. Avast is here to keep you safe online. They're a global leader in cyber protection for more than 30 years and are trusted by over 435 million users to prevent over 1.5 billion cyber attacks every month. They empower you with digital safety and privacy no matter who you are, where you are, or how you connect. Avast's new all-in-one solution, Avast One, is their best protection yet. It's super easy to use. Like, I got my husband to use it. I got my parents to use it. I'm absolutely sure that you've got it. And it helps you to take control of your safety online with a whole range of features. Avast believes essential protection should be free to everyone. So their free version of Avast One includes award-winning antivirus, free VPN, free firewall, and much more. Their premium version has even more advanced protection, and it allows you to protect multiple devices. If, like me, you don't pay enough attention to what you're doing online, like saving important personal information, like saving passwords directly to my browser, or sharing personal photos over not the most secure connection, Avast One can really upgrade your online world. Their privacy features keep your identity and actions hidden. Their performance products clean up and speed up your devices, and their security solutions stop malware, phishing, and virus attacks. They literally have everything covered, so you don't really have to get nervous whenever you hear about a major data leak in the news. Like I mentioned, Avast can upgrade every aspect of your online world, but one feature that really makes me feel safe is their ransomware protection. 
So obviously I work in media, I podcast, write, I have more audio, video, and photo files than my desktop can manage. Basically, my entire life lives in a big pile on my computer, but Avast secures all of those photos, documents, and files from being modified, deleted, or encrypted by ransomware attacks, which is a real thing that actually happens to people in my industry. I feel like we always hear about this data leak or is this some company getting hacked, but like imagine if that actually happened to you in your real life today. How would that blow things up for you? Avast can truly save your digital presence and keep you safe and secure online. For me, I really get a lot out of their free antivirus. I need to download a ton of different media files as a part of my job. And usually these are being sent to me from sources or people I've interviewed once and they're really short and I don't have time to verify every single thing. So using Avast, I can feel safe that even though I will do my due diligence as any smart person using a computer will, when I fail, Avast will be there to help prevent horrible disaster in my professional and personal life. So we want to thank Avast again for supporting Too Good To Be True. Confidently take control of your online world with Avast One. It helps you stay safe from viruses, phishing attacks, ransomware, hacking attacks, and other cyber crimes. Learn more about Avast One at Avast.com. That's Avast.com. So it's this kind of like magical thinking, go after your dreams, you can have it all just hustle harder that made her, of course, a perfect fit for the LM conference circuit, which is what happened mm -hmm. next. So she takes the um, success of this first book, Girl, Wash Your Face, and she starts speaking at Arbonne, LuLaRoe conferences, beach body conferences. And I mean, she made a lot of money for this. So she made, you know, reportedly somewhere between like 100 to 200 grand speaking So she's getting the speaking fee yes. and she's getting access to an already curated audience exactly that has right. needs and wants quick or easy solutions. Yes. So there is really no lack of really great commentary on this on YouTube. There's this one particular uh, woman who I want to shout out, Smokey Glow. She dives into this video that calls this out and be like, it's pretty shitty that Rachel is like, making millions off of, you know, presumably, um, these conferences when MLMs are successful due to the fact that most people are not making money. Like the way that they're able to pay her fee yeah. is because all of this product that these, you know, these people are buying. And it's just really, really, you know, it's just all sorts of snake messy. eating its own tail of just horrible financial <laughs> situations. It's so true. So after becoming, you know, a really successful conference speaker, which by the way, I have to say, she is a riveting speaker. Mm -hmm. She has a ton of charisma. She does not, you know, go on tangents. Like she's really able to connect with people. And that is a power of hers that, you know, unfortunately she has wielded in this way. But I do want to acknowledge like she has a talent. Like she has an innate talent that draws people to her and definitely drew me to her. I mean, no question. So – she and her husband, Dave, decide to take her, you know, success on the MLM conference and open their own conference called Rise, which if you've ever seen any videos of this, um, it is Tony Robbins in pink wash. Mm -hmm. That is really what it is. That is the vibe. There's lots of physical movement. You know, there's lots of breakout sessions. There's lots of people telling you that you can have it all, that it is possible to be super victorious and successful in every single area of your life at the same time. And it's just you who's in the way of making that happen. That is essentially the messaging. So she, you know, these things were very successful. I mean, selling out like hotcakes, you know, all over. And then she follows up with another book called Girl, Stop Apologizing. And this is actually where I came in. I didn't read Girl, Wash Your Face. I read Girl, Stop Apologizing. That's where I sort of got on board. And 
I, I, I have to say, I find it very interesting that the titles of these books are unassailably fine advice. Exactly. Like the yes. kernel of truth is right there in the headline. And then the rest of the book is just kind of like dancing around. So true. So it it received a similarly enormous, um, you know, debut, smashing, you know, all sorts of records. And it's whereas before it was more about like her personal story there's still obviously a ton about that in the second book, but it's really about the acceptance of like naked ambition and like that there are all these lies that you're believing about yourself that keep you from this ultimate goal again of like being a millionaire and and having the perfect home life and having this super successful business and perfect body and you know like all the things within the realms of that as you said curated imperfection exactly so how tied in to her brand at this point is that curated imperfection that like I'm not perfect but I got it together so you're not perfect y'all get it together oh it's still very much a thing so one of the things that I used to watch her on was she and Dave made a Instagram live, um, and I guess it was also on Facebook too, a morning show. And it was her usually with no makeup, but obviously with like fake eyelashes, which she would like talk about. So there's still this like, again, it's just curated. No makeup, but a team of estheticians, amazing products. Exactly. You know, lash extensions, hair extensions, yeah. lighting, filters. I mean, the list goes on and on at that point when you're that rich. Actually, I think we have a clip of their morning show to listen to. And I believe this is supposed to give us a taste of their interpersonal dynamic towards the end of their marriage. I could, you could have on literally YouTube. picked... Anything in the world. There are one billion different video possibilities on YouTube. And the place you went was yeah. how to care for tomatoes. I spent four hours learning how to be a better tomato mom. Okay. That's a, it's, I mean, here's the thing. Oh I'm, not gonna, I'm not going to judge your shirts. choices. Where are my fellow gardeners at? And should we have shirts made that say tomato mom? Because that is freaking hilarious. There has to already be a clan of people who rec- rec- like Hashtag know tomato themselves mom. as a tomato mom. Whoa, because you know people like fur mom, fur dog mom. I don't know this. Okay, anyway. Okay. Okay, guys, so I'm watching four hours. I'm like, this is insane. You, There must be something better that you can do. You can are, I just ask, yeah. after the first like 20 minutes of learning how to be a better tomato what was it that had you decide? It was fascinating. You know what? I need another three hours and 40 minutes of this. Because YouTube just keeps pulling you in. Yeah. It's also why I don't go on YouTube. It just keeps sucking you into things. So first you're going to learn about like... The difference between um, tomatoes that have like a set pattern and how, how high they can grow and then tomatoes that don't have a set pattern and how high they can grow and that you have to prune those in totally different ways. Then I got to get into How do I keep my hands off her? How do I keep my hands off her? Control. She starts talking about different kinds of tomatoes. How then do I, I keep my hands video. off of her? Then I watched a video about how you can affect the taste of the tomato based on how you water it. Like I was no. Well, for you. For you it was. So then I'm like, there must be something better. Those seem like two people who love each other a lot and have a lot to teach us. <laughs> exactly right. So in, like, during the background of this second book coming out, she actually convinces her husband, Dave, to leave his job at Disney to become the CEO of their newly fashioned Hollis company. And not only that, they come to my hometown, Austin, Texas, oh, to wow. do this. Yes. Yeah, so this is why she's on my plane is yeah. that we're actually living in the same city. And they go on to start multiple podcasts. Dave writes his own book. There's a branded journal. They open this. They start an app a lifestyle workout app that apparently is just like the most basic, like boiler, you know. Do like, sit-ups. Yes. <laughs> Lift things. Have a 10-minute like meditation, you know. It's kind yeah. of like this whole body thing called the Rise app. There's an Amazon documentary made and a Quibi show. Oh, like this. A star is born. <laughs> This woman 
is like hitting yeah. all of these things. And it's no matter who clear. you are and what kind of content you like, she had something to sell you. It feels like an influencer bingo game. It's just like, yes, 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 yes. And as, you know, a just like a normal person who runs a business who has one child, which by the way, she has four. I just am looking at this and I'm like, at the time I was like, if she can do it, if she wakes up with the same quote unquote 24 hours <laughs> as me, why don't I have that? Yeah. But then <laughs> the cracks start to show. What was the first crack? Not that fell fell into place for you, but that in the larger group, like the larger fandom for her. Do you remember what the first big wave was where people were starting to question things? I think it was wh where I came oh, really? in. Yes. Yeah. So <laughs> on June 8th, 2020, which by the way was my 13-year wedding anniversary, Rachel and Dave announced that they're getting a divorce. After he had left Disney. Yes. And they had built an entire empire yes. on how important their healthy relationships and viewpoints. Bingo. And, damn. Yes. Damn. So, and in both of their posts revealing kind of this decision, because of course on the same day, both on their, uh, on both of their personal Instagram channels, and I'm assuming other ones as well, they hinted that they had been at odds for three years. So do the backtrack on that, right? Like, it's 2020, 2019, 2018 is when her book, you know, Girl Stop Apologizing comes out. Like, So this has been a lie that they're openly admitting. This is the thing. Since pre-book. All of these years that they've been pumping out branded content about how happy and successful they are as a couple. And by the way, so another awesome YouTuber that I have to shout out, Camelia Kazan. She points that, like, you know, they were selling this vision of their relationship and they are producing all of this relationship, you know, advice, podcasts, and they sold a marriage conference. Yes, with tickets <laughs> that sold for upwards of like $1,700. If I paid $1,700 for marriage advice from someone that was currently at <laughs> odds with their spouse, I'd feel a little duped. Exactly. One more time. Here's Savi Leiser on what the divorce meant to their audience. I don't think that anyone would have been upset at them for getting a divorce if they hadn't sold their marriage. Like, they literally sold a marriage conference. They literally put their marriage, uh, like, they... They admitted in a video, like, we're not licensed marriage therapists, but we're going to do a marriage conference and you guys will we'll teach you all about how to manage your finances better and how to communicate better. And it's like, well, you're not qualified to do that. And then in her book that came out after, she even admitted that she didn't always know what advice to give people because she wasn't a professional. It's like, well, what, will people, what were people paying you for? So it just seemed more like a, a money scam. Whenever I see a business where the product is vague, I start to get a little suspicious of it mainly because you know in the past I've I did a video on this too I've accidentally gone to an MLM recruitment thing in the past because I thought it was a real job interview and looking back it's like I should have noticed that the company I was looking at was very vague in its mission didn't talk a lot about what exactly it was selling I should have been more careful in this case it was someone really selling empowerment almost which is a concept and it's not to say you can't sell a concept or that you can't do it ethically it's just that it's very hard to know exactly what she was selling. I know she was selling books, she was selling private events, yeah, public events. I'm wary of the self-help genre in general, because uh, the whole idea of like selling motivation and selling empowerment gets very close to MLMs. And that's why almost all the self-help gurus speak at MLM conferences, because it's all about, you know, you want to sell someone, like you said, the lifestyle. You're not necessarily, it's just like in the MLM, it's not about the product, it's about selling the lifestyle. So I definitely think that that was part of it. And as the business's mission, like, cause she started as party planning. That was a clear mission. As your business's mission gets more squishy and vague, I can see how people might become a little more, a little more uh, suspicious of it just because 
you don't really know what they're selling at that point. Are they just trying to get money from you? Are they just trying to sell you the lifestyle that they're living? That's kind of a thing to watch out for. See, I find this so fascinating because we do live in an age where every life event of an influencer who has monetized their life also becomes a landmark event and money-making opportunity oh, that wow. can, their brand can be tenpoled on. So if you're uploading lifestyle content, um, including things about your personal life, pregnancies, marriages, engagements, divorces, deaths in the family, all of this are, these are large events that you, they're new elements to your brand that you can monetize. So you've seen this, like, I'm sure you've seen the YouTube phenomena of the couple that has a YouTube channel together and then eventually decides <laughs> to break up and they do that very uncomfortable video that they like <laughs> clearly rehearsed and they clearly have so much like some of them do a better job of covering up than others but some of them they just have such contempt for each other at this point uh. and they're sitting there like they're at gunpoint just being like we feel that the time has come <laughs> and they try to give you that pitch of this, this is, isn't a bad thing this is the hardest video we've ever made if anything we're strong for making it if anything mm. you should take our advice because we're being so honest if anything now there's two brands we can monetize so please go follow my husband's new channel where i'll and, 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 like it just wait oh no <laughs> because on the heels of this announcement <laughs> Guess what happens? Oh, God. She's got a book, and it's called Didn't See That Coming. Ooh. So she did, in fact, decide she, she would did. monetize the fact that she had <laughs> lied for several years to the same audience. That takes a real bold... I mean, that was the point where I was like, okay. Okay. Now I see what has been sold to me. And I'm done. <laughs> like, I wish it hadn't taken that long. And to me, you know, that divorce announcement, which for a lot of her fan base, I think we should acknowledge, are like self-proclaimed Christians. And so obviously this is going to be like a thing for them, right? Um, that, you know, she's touting Jesus and la la and oh my gosh, you know, getting divorced. But I think for me, because I followed her as a promise of what I could have and build while maintaining a really healthy relationship, it really hit me. And it was another reason why I actually got off social media is because the temptation, just for me personally, myself, to build a quote unquote personal brand mm -hmm. and like share these things of my life because I'm a natural sharer. I just am. I'm enthusiastic. I love to share parts of my life. And I hate to use the word authentic. Like, I don't like that. But I just like to be open with people and, yeah. you know, be vulnerable. And it's just too big a temptation for me to fall down that, like, and now I – am very specifically editing out big parts of my life that I don't want you to know about so that I can portray myself as this thing. And it really completely changed what I thought I wanted for myself as like an influencer and brand. And I'm like, I don't want any of that, actually. Thanks. <laughs> no, thanks. So when this happened, did it all click for you at once and you were able to kind of dump her advice out of your head? Or did you mm. feel like, all right, well, I'll take the parts of this that have been working for me without realizing that it's kind of all baked into a whole concept. It was unfortunately a bit of a gradual thing okay. where I was like, okay, the messenger is broken, but there's some gold in here. It didn't take me very long okay. to start to realize, you know, the, the amount of red flags that I just missed or didn't want to see, right? In, in this whole thing. And so another thing that pushed me even further out from like, oh, okay, I don't like her, but I don't really feel antagonistic towards her was, <laughs> girl just keeps digging herself a hole, okay? <laughs> girl dig a hole should be like your next <laughs> book. Like, girl, don't dig yourself a hole, okay? Um, she posts a video on TikTok where she is responding to a follower who has been calling her out for talking about like having basically a house cleaner as not being relatable. 
And she looks in the camera and says, sis, what makes you think I want to be relatable? After all of this? After all this. And not only that, in the caption, <laughs> stop, ready? She posts like Harriet Tubman, <laughs> Oprah, um, Frida Kahlo, Malala Yousafzai, Wei Zetian, like Wu Zetian, <gasps> as evidence of other women who are unrelatable that she is wanting to be like. Interesting. Interesting. So she is an activist on the front lines. I mean, yes. I mean, she is fighting the good fight uh, out there. And of course, the blowback on this is immense and enormous. I remember this because it, the reason I think that it, it got through to me was that it was an influencer who clearly had risen to some enormous status, even if I wasn't super familiar with mm -hmm. the specifics, but who had said the thing that they, the quiet part out loud, essentially, <laughs> yes. that influencers are keeping a secret, which is that they have disdain for their audience. I don't know that that's always true for every influencer, I but don't. it is it is true for enough of a percentage that it would shock you. I Well, I think that that's not something she started with. I don't think that way, but it's very clear that that is where, I mean, it almost seems like an something you can't avoid. When you build your brand like this, meant to vault yourself as, again, this product, this um, this thing, this ideal that you want everybody to strive for, you have to distance yourself over time and be like, if I'm selling myself, I have to be apart from everybody. Ultimately, it doesn't matter. But as an aside, do you think she believes her own bullshit across the board or do you think she fundamentally knows she's peddling lies because there's a big cognitive dissonance yes. to be fighting with her husband then go on stage at a marriage conference but there's less of a cognitive dissonance if you're like I have all the answers because I have all this money which proves I have all the answers yeah so now I know I have all the answers and I believe it oh that's a good question I think at the time yes I think for the most part she really truly believes this stuff. However, I feel like cracks are beginning to show. Mm. So most recently, she just had another Rise conference that looks completely different than they used to. It is very clear to me that the sort of Dave influence on that what that product and experience was was pretty intense. I mean, I mean, a Disney executive is going to know branding, is going to know media precisely, and I think that's really what he sort of brought to that. But sh there's a lot less Jesus, mm. a lot more universe, uh, new age stuff. That, oh, harder to pin yes. down. Can't be fact checked. Exactly. <laughs> there's a lot more new age stuff starting to creep in and. The thing that really got me, because I watched a little bit of this footage, is that she basically blames Dave for that hustle culture mindset. And this is a pattern with her, is that after that big whole TikTok debacle and through many times that she has basically plagiarized the words of other people, like she puts still eye rise on you know, on everything and didn't that's credit. A rich, that's, a, that's a Rachel Hollis quote, apparently. <laughs> I, uh, Angelou. <laughs> like, and then she says, my team did this. Like, oh. I take responsibility, but my team, mm -hmm. you know, my team, Dave. They're flawed. I'm not. There's Forgive a lot. Them. There's a lot of deflection happening when it comes to critiquing her content and, you know, what she's essentially trying to sell people. So I, I like to answer your question, I don't really know where she is now, but she certainly has things to sell and she's divorced now. And so Hollis Co. is the brand, but it seems like the longer they're apart, the more sort of like digs come in. And yeah, it's just- it's just, She's on negative messaging about him at this point. I would say so. I mean, I've tried to <laughs> distance myself. Yeah, you don't want to get content. Yeah. We all have a few muted characters. <laughs> Just for this, I was like, okay, I'm ready to dive back in and see what more she's like coming out with. But yeah, the the shift is pretty noticeable. Hmm. Yeah. When we talk about the scammy nature 
of this. I mean, influencers are everywhere, right? Like the self-help culture is really intense, especially around building a small business, right? I mean, people, I mean, the, the worse the state of the world gets, the more people need help and solutions. And exactly where there is a vacuum, something will fly in and fill the space. Exactly. And there is something very tempting about the messaging that only you are in your own way because you have control over you. What you don't have control over are systems. So they're selling you a sense of control. Oh, 100%. In my view, that is ultimately what self-help is about. It is selling a line of control, that you are ultimately in control of your destiny. And isn't that, it's oppressive when you really think about it, but it's also somewhat freeing. Yeah, in the short term, it's great. I mean, then you can exactly. be like, there'll be no anything uphill is just on me. All the answers are in here. I just yes. need to find them. But then. But then there's after, something wrong with you and it's not working. After the conference, <laughs> after you leave and after the dopamine starts to wear off, mm. who is there to blame but you? Yeah. If you are ultimately in control, then you are the only one to blame. And if at night you're worrying and anxiety and you're and you're, you're swirling nerves about the stress of this thing that isn't working out and what's wrong with you, you wake up in the morning, you can start a new fresh day with their morning show. <laughs> that is crazy. Exactly. That is really insidious. Yes. So I think I've learned so much from this experience, uh, you know, of me. It really, it is an experience. Following someone and delving into their content sort of like, you know, wholeheartedly and being like, I'm going to commit to this vision. I mean, it could have been way even worse than it was, oh. which it sounds like it got pretty bad, <laughs> yeah. like emotionally. Yeah, exactly. And I never spent any money except for buying one book. Yeah. I never went to there anything. There are people who probably shelled out. Oh, yes. I've heard answer. stories of people who've spent thousands and thousands oh. of dollars trying to Emulate the up. life of a rich wife. Exactly. <laughs> I mean, you said it, <laughs> but I was kind of proud of myself for figuring out a few things that I want just to highlight for people that I took away that I now am much more aware of. Lay it on me. I think when you're thinking about buying something from somebody, anything, what are they selling and is it unique? Mm. Because ultimately when you dive down into Rachel's content, none of it's unique. It's all recycled. It's all recycled content. It's just in a new package. I think encouraging people to give up sleep in order to, quote unquote, make time is a big thing I see on a lot of these self-help influencers. There's like this weird fixation on like being an early riser as being the key to success. I've heard messaging so far as to say if you wake up at four, you can make a full extra day of work in a week. Like, God. yeah. People you, who are already working five to seven days a exactly week. Exactly right. So I think really watch out for that stuff. Yeah. I think you can be successful in your life without having to have your health take a beat. Yeah. And no, and no like, advice should start with hurt yourself. Exactly. This is something also I sort of keyed into. And also I have to say shout out to maintenance phase. One of my really favorite podcasts, they also did a fantastic deep dive on Rachel Hollis and they brought this up of this idea of like, is what they're selling a syllabus of their own life? Yeah. Right? Yeah. Like, be so careful. Like, I was so tempted to do that. And I'm like, you know. Well, every marriage, every person is different. Every marriage is different. Every relationship is different. And so if someone's giving you a guide, it's a guide to their marriage with you're not them. You don't have their marriage or their circumstances exactly. or their experiences. It doesn't apply. If people are just sharing their experiences and saying, this is what I learned from this experience that I went through, and it stops there, fantastic. I think that is a way that we relate to people. But when they say, and now this is a lesson for you. Do exactly and Do think this. exactly how I tell you. Exactly. Watch out. Another one oversharing. <laughs> That's a red flag. I personally am carrying around. I know. <laughs> I overshare. I am also an overshare, but I think when it comes to these kind of lifestyle influencers, especially those who have children, this is the deal that her children, their children, 
are all over social media. It's compulsive. If I went to a Target and saw her kids, I would recognize her kids. Not good. And they do not have consent. Of course not. And a kid under the age of 18 can't sign off on uh, fame and infamy. Exactly. There is a commodification and a displaying of children that I think is a major red flag. And there's lots of this out there. I mean, mommy influencers, you know, it's like. The child is just an. It's, it, it's, it's a prop. It's a prop. It's an aesthetic and it's, and it's an extension of me. Exactly. Look, you, you should look at this kid because it's evidence of how great I am, not Precisely. a person on their own. Precisely. And then are they consistently acknowledging their privilege and the luck, the dumb luck that has also factored in to aspects of their success? And I think, you know, if if people listening to this are thinking, well, what is her privilege? Is she is it just that she's able bodied? Is it mm-hmm. that she's white? I think you know a good test for me, privilege wise, yeah. is if my life was exactly the same circumstances, setup, factors, events, and I was X different, would it be harder? So if I was black, mm-hmm. if I was a trans woman, if I was in some way disabled, would that have been harder? And since it would it would have been harder, I have the privilege of not having that experience, right? And so I think especially for someone who's like, as a woman, I haven't had any privilege, it's really easy to say, wow, she must have all the answers. But what works for a white woman may not work for a white woman exactly. of a different size, let alone a woman of color, let alone a woman with a disability, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and I think it, it can become sticky because it's such a politicized word. Mm-hmm. But privilege really, you have to create a value neutral definition for yourself, I think. And the final red flag that I want to reiterate is, is there room for pushback or critique on this person's channel? Do they acknowledge being critiqued as something other than hate? Like, let alone change their mind as normal human beings do. Exactly, exactly. It's, I think it's very difficult when you put yourself up as this ideal to make room for the fact that you're going to make mistakes, <laughs> that you're going to change your mind. People change. That is, that is the only guarantee in life is change. And I personally respect people who can more that can be like, hey, you know what? I did this. This was an issue. I'm learning. Here we go. Here's like the newest iteration. And I haven't figured it out for all time. Mm -hmm. You know, this is the newest iteration. So is the person changing, acknowledging where they might, you know, be learning new things or listening to feedback? Or are they branding this as hate, essentially, and negative energy, right? Like, positive vibes only. That is a major red flag. Well, honestly, that was really moving. And thank you so much for your openness about the topic. I'm sure it's tough to be vulnerable and say like, I got this wrong. But unlike Rachel Hollis, you were able to do it. (laughs) Thank you. That is really, really lovely. And I think that that's a great note to leave on that you were wrong. And that's totally fine. We're all wrong. Sometimes. Well, that's the show for this week. You can find Too Good to Be True wherever podcasts are available. And while you're there, we'd love for you to rate the show and leave us a review. I've been Ryan Houlihan, and you can find me on all social media at Ryan Houlihan. I've been Julia Lorenz Olson. You can find me on YouTube at my PBS show, Two Cents. And every once in a while, I'll look at Instagram. My handle is at yay, it's Julia. To learn more about our guest, Savvy Leiser, you can find their YouTube at Savvy Writes Books, or you can go to the website, SavvyWritesBooks.com.